Well, thank you. If you have a Bible, would you grab it and go with me to Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. This is known as the Great Commission. The Great Commission of the Lord Jesus. Right before his ascension, these are the words that Jesus said. This is God's word. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Now, here is my goal for this sermon. I, I want to help you see two very clear things. It is the duty, first of all, it is the duty of the church to rescue those who are being taken away to death. It is the duty of the church, those who have been purchased by the Lord Jesus Christ, filled by his spirit, equipped with various spiritual gifts. It's the duty of the church to rescue those being taken away to death. And the second thing I want to convince you of and show you from the scriptures is that it is the specific duty of pastors to lead the way in rescuing those being taken away to death. It is the specific duty of pastors to lead the way. So that is the doctrine, the summary statement of this whole message. It is the church's duty to rescue those being taken away to death and the specific duty of pastors to lead the way through their words and through their actions, through their words and their deeds, pastors. So how many of you serve as a pastor, elder, overseer of a local church? few of you. The rest of you, this is for you as well, and this is not only for pastors, but that's part of my exhortation, especially as we get towards the end of this message. So the first thing that I want you to understand very clearly, and this is why I read the Great Commission at the beginning of this sermon. Here's the first thing. It is the church's duty to rescue those being taken away to death. Because it is our duty and privilege to obey the Great Commission. It is the church's duty to rescue those being taken away to death. Because it is our duty and privilege to obey the Great Commission. There are two elements, basically, to the Great Commission. One, we would say, a shorthand term would be evangelize people. Preach the gospel to those who are not yet converted. And once they respond in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ, we baptize them, outward showing of their faith in the Lord Jesus, and then we teach them to obey or observe everything that Christ has commanded. So it's not just evangelism, evangelize the nations. No, it's not just tell the nations the good news. It's Make disciples of the nations, which of course includes evangelism. We tell the good news of Christ Jesus to people who do not yet know him and exhort them to repent, turn from their sins, and receive and rest in Christ Jesus alone for salvation. And the second half of the Great Commission is then teaching them to observe, adhere to, obey, submit to Everything that I have commanded them. That's what Christ says. And he doesn't just mean, well, find the red letters in your Bible in the gospel accounts. And that's what Jesus means obey. We only obey the things that are written down that actually came out of the Lord Jesus' mouth when he was incarnate on the earth. No. Do not separate the Old Testament from the New Testament. This is all the revelation of Scripture. So whatever God commands of his people, and it hasn't been expressly said to be abolished or 
fulfilled in the work of Christ, it is still binding on you and me as the moral law of God and its clarifications. So teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. This second half is what I really want to focus on when it comes to abolishing abortion or rescuing those being taken away to death. Just realize the Great Commission says obey every single thing Christ has told you to do. That's your duty, church. That's my duty. So what has Christ said to do? What has he commanded us to do? Well, it's summarized. The moral law of God is summarized in the Ten Commandments. It's summarily comprehended in the Ten Commandments, as the Puritans would say. But we would say the moral law of God is summarized in the Ten Commandments. And it's even further summarized by the Lord Jesus Christ when he came to the earth. And he says, you can summarize it like this. Love God. Love your neighbor. That's what God has commanded of you. Love him. And love your neighbor, even love your neighbor as yourself. That's what God has commanded of you. Now focus on that second part. How do we love our neighbor? What duty do we owe to our neighbor? When Christ says in the Great Commission, teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. What has he commanded you concerning how you should treat your neighbor? Well, many things, but let me point you to just three things. As it pertains to child sacrifice happening in our culture. First, Luke 6.31. As you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. It's the golden rule. Treat other people like you want to be treated. How do you want other people to treat you? Do that to other people. Do that to others. The golden rule. Simply do unto others as you would want done for you. In Proverbs 30, verses 8 and 9 says... Open your mouth for the mute, for those who can't speak, for the rights of all who are destitute. Open your mouth. Judge righteously. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. Proverbs 24, 11 then says, rescue those who are being taken away to death. Hold back those stumbling to the slaughter. That's a very quick summary form of what Christ commands of you and in the Great Commission says you must submit to. And it's your duty to teach other people to submit to the commands of Christ as well. So, love your neighbor as yourself. Speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. Rescue those being taken away to death. And this is why I say working to abolish abortion and rescue those being taken away to death is a great commission issue. It is a great commission issue. Now you can come fight with me later if you want to, but I'm, I'll, I'll say this and we'll move on. Abolishing abortion is not a gospel issue. It's not a gospel issue. You can understand the gospel correctly and not be an abolitionist. You don't have to be an abolitionist to understand or proclaim the gospel correctly. To be an abortion abolitionist, though, is consistent with the Great Commission because he says, obey every single thing I've commanded you to do. It's not a gospel issue. In our day, people make everything a gospel issue. This is a gospel issue. You mean if you don't believe this correctly, you don't have the gospel? Come on. No. But if you don't believe correctly about how we must respond to the abortion holocaust raising among raging among us, you don't obey the Great Commission, as you should, because you are supposed to obey everything that Christ has commanded and tell other people to obey everything that Christ has commanded. So abolishing abortion is a Great Commission issue because abortion abolition is simply a shorthand term for obedience to Christ in the face of the evil of child sacrifice. That's all we mean when we say abortion abolitionism. That's just a shorthand term for what it looks like to obey Jesus in the midst of an abortion holocaust. Abolition in general, not just abortion abolition, but abolition in general is obedience to Christ in the face of a great evil. We work to abolish it. And abortion abolition is a great commission issue because it's just obedience to Jesus. 
in the face of the evil of child sacrifice. So, it is your duty, Christians, it is your duty to rescue those being taken away to death. Because Jesus has commanded you to do to others what you would want done to you. He's commanded you to speak up for those who can't speak for themselves and to rescue those who are being taken away to death. So, it's the church's duty. Everybody who's been purchased by Christ must obey the commands of Christ. And you have to apply his commands to those being taken away to death. So there's point one. It's our duty because it's our duty to obey the Great Commission, and it's our privilege to do so. The second thing that I want you to see, and I want to try to answer for you, is how then, how can the church obey Christ and rescue those being taken away to death? How can we, in obedience to the commands of Jesus and the Great Commission, how can we obey him and rescue those being taken away to death? Well, first, if you're going to obey Christ, you must reject the approval of murder. Amen. You must reject the approval of murder, which, if you haven't connected the dots yet, every single pro-life Legislation, piece of legislation, every single pro-life bill gives approval to murder. You may not think of it like that because those who are filing the bills are not thinking, we're giving approval to murder. We're, they're not thinking that most likely. They're thinking we're trying to save these babies before 16 weeks or fill in the blank. But in the end, that bill literally says you can murder these image bearers of God. Anything short of from the moment of fertilization, all image bearers of God are treated equally under the law. Anything short of that is giving approval to murder. So you, in your past, me, in my past, when you have celebrated pro-life incremental regulations, you have in effect actually celebrated the approval of child sacrifice. Saying, well, at least we saved these. Friends, in effect, you have given your approval to murder if you've supported or even celebrated these kinds of bills. Pro-life bills that regulate child sacrifice are an abomination in the sight of God. Amen. They are an abomination in the sight of God. He hates them. He hates anyone who sets in statute, you can murder my image bearers. And that's what every one of these bills does. All incremental bills do, in effect, is tell a mother when, where, how, or why they are allowed to dismember their child. Or when, where, how, and why they're allowed to starve their baby to death by pills. Or suck them out with a vacuum. To support any kind of legislation other than, what I would say to you, a five-component abolition bill, anything short of that, is to give approval to murder. You must reject approving of murder. What does God say about this? And the reason I speak of it like that, giving your approval to murder, and that all pro-life regulations do that in the end. The reason I say it's evil is because at the end of Romans 1, the Apostle Paul is listing what is characteristic of idolaters, and he lists murder in this long line of list. This long line, and it, then he says at the end of Romans 1, Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, murder, but they give approval to those who practice them. If you approve of child sacrifice, even in the name of trying to save as many babies as you can, in the end, you are acting not like a Christian, you are acting like an idolater who has given approval to murder. Do you support or celebrate bills that regulate child sacrifice? What would you want done for you if you were in the womb? Would you want regulations for when, where, how, and why you could be murdered? Or would you want the bride of Christ to stand up and reject any approval of it and say, establish equal protection under the law? Amen. You know what you would. You must, first of all, if you're going to rescue those being taken away to death, you must, first of all, reject the approval of murder. 
Christ has not commanded us to regulate the high places where children are sacrificed. He's not commanded us to regulate these high places. He's commanded us to tear them down. So an abolition bill, unlike a pro-life regulation bill, treats all image bearers of God equally under the law, giving equal protection to all from the moment of fertilization without exception or compromise and not caring if the Supreme Court says we can't do it. Reject the approval of murder. That's how you'll rescue those, and that's your duty, church. Second, if you're going to obey Christ when it comes to rescuing those being taken away to death, you must actually demand your legislators to establish equal justice. You live in a represented society. You don't live under the heel of tyrants like many people have in the past. You have a House representative, you have a state senator, and they represent you if you're from Kansas here in Topeka. Do they know how they must represent you, how you want them to represent you? Do they know what God, who is their master, commands of them as a civil servant? It's your duty to tell them. And it's your duty to not settle for anything less than equal protection under the law, establishing justice for your pre-born neighbors. The job description of governing authorities, such as state senators or house representatives or the governor, from the bottom all the way to the top, the job description of them is not determined by the majority. It's determined by the Lord. And it's your job to tell them how to obey their master. Romans 13, 3 and 4. Rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. That means they're not meant to be, they're not supposed to be a terror to good conduct, but they're meant to be a terror to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority, Paul asks? Then do what is good and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant. Those in positions of authority in your state are God's servants, and they must obey him. They are his deacons, his table waiters, the ones who execute his commands. They're his servants for your good. But if you do wrong, Paul says, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. It means he's not supposed to bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. This is the role of governing authorities. Approve of good conduct, punish evildoers, and thwart them from doing their evil by threatening punishment on them so that they wouldn't do it. This is the job of your governing authorities in your state. And so tell them what their duty is. Psalm 82, 2 through 4. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Speaking specifically to governing authorities. Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. That is the Lord who is the master of all civil servants. Telling governing authorities what their duty is. And it's your job as believers in Jesus Christ to go and tell them what their master says is their job. Amen. If you don't go and tell your house rep or your state senator what Christ demands of them, who's going to? Yep. You and I must do it and tell them how you want them to represent you in the legislature. Psalm 2, 8 through 12. Speaking specifically now to governing authorities. This is the father saying it to the son in Psalm 2. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. O rulers of the earth, be warned. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, 
for his wrath is quickly kindled, and blessed are all who take refuge in him. Have you ever said things like that to your house rep or your state senator? Hey, listen, let me just read to you the end of Psalm 2, where Christ, who has been seated on the throne, and the Father says, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Christ is the king now. All authority has been given to him now. And so that's why Psalm 2 says, Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and trembling. Kiss the Son. It means bow down before the Lord Jesus and kiss his feet, paying homage to him because he is your master. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. You have to speak with those principles, those foundations in mind when you talk to governing authorities and tell them to obey Christ, who they're going to stand before one day and give an account for how they've used the authority that he's delegated to them in the civil sphere. That's how you can rescue those being taken off to death. Reject the approval of murder. Second, demand your legislators to establish equal justice, equal protection under the law for all image bearers. If you don't, tell them who will. The third way that you can rescue those being taken away to death, and I hope all of these, I hope to be very practical and so that you can leave today or tomorrow and think, I've got some very clear action items of this is what I can do to rescue those being taken away to death in obedience to the commands of Christ. And if you have any questions about any of these five things I mentioned, please come and talk to me and ask me. I'd love to help you think through it more. But here's the third way. This doesn't have to do necessarily with legislation. Abolishing abortion, rejecting the approval of murder, and Telling your governing authorities to obey Christ and establish justice, that will handle all these things that are coming after it. But these are the things you should be doing in the meantime as you labor to abolish abortion and making it illegal. Here's the third thing. If you're going to obey Christ, you must reject medical practices and medicines that murder babies or were produced from murdered babies. Amen. You must reject medical practices and medicines that murder babies or were produced from murdering babies. Let me just ask you a few questions that you, that I hope that you will think about, especially you who are pastors. You oversee people's souls. Do you know what hormonal birth control does to image bearers of God? How many people in your churches, pastors, how many women are, are taking hormonal birth control? Do you know that the third mechanism of what you and I call the pill, the third mechanism, there's three. The first two are preventative. The third one is abortifacient. Hormonal birth control murders babies Amen. in your congregation. Have you done the research to be able to tell those who are in your charge, hey, you need to know what this does. We have to reject these kinds of things that murder image bearers of God. Did you know hormonal birth control does that? Women who are here, do you know that's what the pill does? A study came out in 2016 saying that levonorgestrel, which is that third mechanism in the pill, it's also what they use in Plan B, which is a way that you can murder your baby within the first 72 hours of intercourse. They came out with a study in 2016 that said, well, 85% of the time, that third mechanism, which is murdering babies, is actually what's functioning in hormonal birth control. They thought it was much less, which still makes it an evil thing. If it could potentially kill a human being, it wouldn't do that. But they came out and even said, it seems 85% of the time, maybe even more, that the pill is murdering your children. Pastors, tell people the truth. People don't even want to talk about things like that. Why? Because so many people do it. Pastors, how many people in your church have done in vitro fertilization? Do you know what happens 
and in vitro fertilization? Have you educated those who you oversee their souls? Have you educated them? Have you educated yourself well enough to speak the truth to them and help them realize that in vitro fertilization murders millions of babies? And the ones that are not murdered are locked in freezers right now. There's 1.6 million image bearers of God currently locked in freezers in the United States because of in vitro fertilization. And ethicists at seminaries won't talk about it. They won't touch it. Why? Because so many Christians do it, and they don't want to take a position on it. We have to be educated on these things and realize that there are many things that are leading to the slaughter of babies, not just at abortion clinics, but through hormonal birth control, through IVF. Do you know what is in many of the vaccines that you may have put in your body or put in your children's bodies? You know how quickly the COVID vaccines got to the public? It got here more quickly than it would have got here because they tested it or they put in it abortive fetal tissue. Babies that were murdered so that we could get vaccines to us faster. Do you know what's in certain vaccines? If you're going to obey Christ when it comes to rescuing those being taken away to death, you need to know certain medical practices and certain medicines that murder babies or were produced from murdering babies and reject them. Why would we even get close to those kinds of things? Fourthly, if you're going to obey Christ when it comes to the Great Commission, obeying his commands and rescuing the weak and the needy, those being taken away to death, you need to go to the murder mills. If you live anywhere within driving distance of abortion clinics where parents are carrying off their children to the slaughter, you need to go there and preach the gospel, believers. Preach the gospel. Plead with parents to have mercy on their children. Provide help for them. We, had, we started doing that as our local church and other people in our area. We started doing that less than a year and a half ago. Finally, we started doing it after being apathetic for years and years when it comes to that issue. And we had no idea what we were doing other than babies are murdered here. We're going to try to go plead with people and preach the gospel. It's a bottleneck. All these people coming there, they're coming there to murder their children. And so we started going and trying to just pray, talk with people, and see what happens. And just at the one clinic that we go to in Tulsa, about 45 minutes from where I live, We've seen over 40 babies saved in the last year. Amen. A little less than a year and a half. You don't have to know what you're doing. You have to be willing to go and speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. And stand up, stand in that gap, interposing in between parents who want to murder their children and those children themselves. And the Lord will save babies. And at the very least, you'll just be obedient to Jesus. You'll be speaking up for those who can't speak for themselves. If you really want to obey Christ and rescue those being taken off to death, go to the places where they are literally being taken off to death. Preach the truth, plead, provide help, and see what the Lord does. Fifth, and this is my last practical point concerning how to rescue those being taken off to death. You must talk about the horrors of abortion. You have to talk about it. Pastors, you have to preach about it. You have to preach about the horrors of child sacrifice. You have to tell people how evil it is to murder an image bearer of God. And it's even more wicked and evil. There's several aggravations involved in murdering an innocent child in what should be the safest place in our world, inside its mother's womb. You have to talk about it. Proclaim the horrors of abortion, not just pastors, every one of you individually. If you are not willing to talk about the abortion holocaust with other people in your society, you are no different.
than the Germans who were living during the Holocaust, and they just didn't want to talk about the fact that the Nazis were exterminating the Jews. Can you imagine living, looking back, and saying, you know, I lived during the Holocaust in Nazi Germany. But I didn't really say anything because, you know, it was just, I didn't want to get into politics. I didn't really want to get, I didn't really want to offend anybody. We've murdered 10 times the amount that Hitler murdered. And still, many Christians don't want to talk about it. I've heard from multiple pastors, they don't want to preach about it because there are women in my congregation who have had abortions. And I don't want them to feel unnecessary guilt. But what you're doing is actually robbing them of the conviction of sin they should be feeling. And you're robbing them of preaching the cross of Christ to them and them understanding that the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse them of that sin. Amen. You're not loving women who have had abortions and by skirting the issue or not talking about it. You are hating them. You are hating women who have had abortions. If you won't tell them this is wicked and Christ died for wicked people like me and like you to cleanse us from that. You can be free from that guilt. Yes. You hate women if you won't talk about this. You hate those women who have had abortions. You'd rather keep them comfortable. But you're robbing them of the joy of knowing the evil they've done and being freed because of what Christ has done for them. And in addition to that, you're not only hating women, you who won't talk about abortion, whether you be pastors or laymen, if you won't talk about it, you not only hate women who've had abortions, under the guise of not wanting to offend them, you also hate the baby in the womb that you won't speak up for. Many only consider women who are having abortions when it comes to, well, we have to be compassionate when we talk about this issue. And I would say, compassionate to who? Yeah. The woman and the man who are murdering their children? Rather than compassionate to the baby in the womb that has no one to defend them, we should be compassionate to both for sure. But when people say that, they're just thinking, man, women are going to think you're mean. Like, what's the baby going to think? What, what would you think if no one would speak up for you? So I, I put it like this. You must proclaim the horrors of abortion and point everyone to Christ crucified. Christ can deliver from any sin. Christ was, he willingly allowed himself to be murdered for murderers so that they could be forgiven of the sin of murdering. Amen. His first word from the cross was, Father, forgive them. To who? His murderers. Speak up about the horrors of abortion and point everyone to Christ crucified. Now, Two finishing points that will move much faster, and it's less on the ground and practical, and it's more ideological, theological, but I think these two points are really missed. So here's the next thing I want to draw your attention to. It's the duty of the church to lead the way in rescuing, whether it be a, by rejecting legislation that regulates child sacrifice, by talking to your legislators, by going to the mills, by rejecting certain medicines, by speaking up about it, all these things. It's our duty to rescue in all these ways that I've mentioned to, and to lead the way in rescuing because society is downstream from the church. Society is downstream from the church. How the church goes, that's how society will go. How the church goes, that's how society will go. The reason we have child sacrifice that's accepted in our nation is because of the church's apathy toward it. We have 500,000 plus professed Southern Baptists just in the state of Oklahoma. If just the Southern Baptists would stand up and tell their governing authorities to abolish abortion, it would be done. It would be done. Legislators will often ask, what do the Southern Baptists think about it? Because we're the biggest 
Protestant denomination in Oklahoma. What do the Southern Baptists say about it? Like, well, they passed a resolution saying abortion must be abolished, but they go, yeah, but what are they doing about it? And because many are doing nothing, the legislators drag their feet and they don't establish justice. It's the duty of the church to lead the way in rescuing because society is affected by the church. It's downstream from the church. You can see it negatively if you just look historically. You can see this negatively. Why did feminism take root in our society? Why is it almost a norm for many women? Even within the church. And they don't really realize it, but they're actually just feminists. Why? Because when it started coming about, many in the church did nothing. And some in the church actually said it's a good thing. And they totally switched the roles of men and women. And now we see the logical conclusion of where we're at. We're saying, our legislators are saying, we should have women as soldiers in the army. That's an abomination to God as well. It's the duty of men, not women. So why did feminism take root? Well, because it's downstream from the church. The church was apathetic about it, and even some in the church started talking about how it would be a good thing. And so it took root. There weren't people that stood up against it. Why is statism such a large thing in Protestant denominations? Which means whatever the government says, well, that's our job to do it. If they tell me to put pinwheels on my head, I have to put pinwheels on my head. That's statism, which bows down to the civil government as if they are a little G god. And whatever they say, we have to do it. Why, did, why do we have statism? Because the church has been soft on it. And they don't understand or teach what Romans 13 actually says and means for those who are God's servants. They only look at the part that says submit to them. Why do we have pietism? Because the church has been apathetic towards being engaged in the society. And we've turned over the society to other people. We've been apathetic towards establishing justice in the public square. And so there's no justice there. Why do we have the acceptance of child murder? As many, even on the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission's website. That's the ERLC, the ethical arm nationally of Southern Baptists. It literally says on their website, when we have the 50th anniversary of Roe v. Wade, we will be remembering when abortion became a stable or a regular part of our society. And they're already planning now, a year beforehand, to celebrate or commemorate the 50th anniversary of that as a horrible day when it became a staple in our society, a permanent part of our society, they say. Hormonal birth control. IVF, exceptions to surgical or chemical abortion such as rape, incest, or the alleged life of the mother. Why are all these things staples in our society? It's because the society does what the church does. It's downstream from us. And when we're apathetic on all these things, of course, society is going to be. You can see this positively, that society is downstream from the church. That means what the church does is going to affect the society as a whole positively. Who of you have adopted children before? Who of you know someone personally that's adopted children? Okay, most of us in the room. That's because Christians changed society. People did not adopt children like you and I do today before the time of Christ. They only would adopt them in order to further on their line for purely selfish reasons. But Christians changed society because they started adopting those who are weak and innocent and started saying, these deserve protection, these deserve love. Those who are unwanted or someone's unable to care for them, they deserve love and a home. And now unbelievers adopt kids. It's a normal part of society that adoption is good. We have people going to the mills to murder their children and say, are you going to adopt my baby? Why? Because it's an accepted part of society now, because the church led the way on it. You can look at hospitals. We're probably within a few miles of hospitals. Why do we have hospitals like we do? 
Because the church led the way on that. The church said we need to have these places set up to care for the sick, to care for the needy. And so we have hospitals today because of that. Why was slavery abolished? It wasn't secular humanists. It was Christians who rose up and said, God says equal justice. God says equal weights and measures. God hates chattel slavery. God hates man stealing. He hates. And so they rose up and they abolished slavery. I mean, do you know anybody who says, you know what? Chattel slavery is a really good thing. No. Almost everyone says that was the right thing to do. Slavery was such a great evil. Well, why? They didn't all think that at the time. But society's been changed because it's downstream from the church. What about the general agreement that racism is evil? Where do people get that idea? It wasn't from just their own reason or logic. It was partly because the law of God has been written on their hearts and partly because Christians have stood up and said all image bearers of God have the same value before him. And to treat someone lesser because of their ethnicity ethnicity is wicked. And so even now, we have critical race theory, who, which I think is a godless ideology. It's a wicked ideology. But the even reason people are concerned about racism is because society has been so changed by Christians saying, this is what God says. This is what's right. You can see it negatively and positively that society is downstream from the church. We can't wait on godless people to establish justice. It's our duty to stand up. And society will follow. And 200 years from now, they'll look back on abortion the same way I think that they look back on slavery and say, what a wicked institution. But godless people weren't saying that 200 years ago. They will about abortion, I believe. Because we'll lead the way on it, and they'll follow us. I want you to consider Isaiah 1, 21 through 23. This principle that society is downstream from the church. This is in Isaiah 1, 21 through 23. How the faithful city has become a whore. That's the first part of verse 21. The faithful city, Jerusalem. The old covenant church of God. The assembly that God's people. Jerusalem being the epicenter of Godliness, the epicenter of worship of Yahweh in the world. And Isaiah says, how the faithful city has become a whore. She is full of injustice. Righteousness lodged in her, but now murderers. There you go. There's the state of the old covenant church. In Isaiah's day, they had become a whore. What flows from that? He says in verse 22, your silver has become dross, your best wine mixed with water, everything is diluted. Your princes are rebels and companions of thieves. Everyone loves a bribe and runs after gifts. They do not bring justice to the fatherless, and the widow's cause does not come to them. Why was Isaiah's day corrupt? Why were there princes their rulers, their governing authorities, not establishing justice because the church had become a whore. Society is downstream from the church. If the church required those who represent us in the legislature to abolish abortion, they would. But the church is not demanding it. They're not calling for it. They're not working for it in a lot of respects. So it's the duty of the church to lead the way in rescuing because Society's downstream from the church. And now, even more specifically, it is the duty of pastors to lead the way in rescuing because the church is downstream from its pastors. As the church goes, so goes the culture. As the pastor and the pulpit goes, so goes the church. And many churches are weak because they have weak pastors. 
Many churches are weak and apathetic when it comes to justice because they have pastors who are not leading them. In Jeremiah 6, 13 and 14, we read, For from the least to the greatest of them, everyone is greedy for unjust gain. Everyone's greedy for unjust gain. And then he says, And from prophet to priest, everyone deals falsely. Even the prophets and even the priests deal falsely. And then he says specifically about these, these spiritual leaders in Israel. They have healed the wound of my people lightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. The spiritual leaders, the church of God is always downstream from the spiritual leaders of God. So when the leaders are weak and apathetic, of course the church is going to be weak and apathetic. And then, of course, the society is going to be unjust because the church is not doing its duty. And the pastors of those churches are not doing their duty to lead, feed, guide and protect the churches. Now, this this truth that churches are downstream from their pastors means you shouldn't expect a church to be more godly or healthy in general than those who lead. it. This is evident evident by these two truths. It's the duty of pastors to feed God's sheep, the whole counsel of God, including the rescue of those being taken away to death. It's the duty of pastors to feed the flock with what? With the word of God. As Paul says in Acts 20, 27, I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God, not just the things that he likes to talk about, but all of the scriptures, all of the subjects, even the really difficult passages like Leviticus 21 through 5, that promises God's wrath on those who kill their children and promises the same wrath on you if you close your eyes while your neighbor is sacrificing their children. That's a difficult passage to preach. But those are the kind of passages that pastors have to preach, especially when we are in a society that's murdered 62 plus million image bearers of God. You preach those passages on child sacrifice and tell them what God says about it. If you don't do that, if you ignore it, then all the people pastors in the congregation that you shepherd are going to think it's not that big of a deal. The church is downstream from the pastors, not only because... It's their job to preach the word and apply the word. But it's also their job. It's your job, pastor. It's your duty to set an example for the flock by your actions, not just your words. This is one of the biggest reasons, I think, that the murder mills are not filled with Christians. Because very few pastors are actually leading their congregations. And setting an example to their congregations. Why are so few Christians speaking to their legislators? Because so few pastors are setting the example of speaking to their legislators. And it's their duty to do that. 1 Peter 5, 2 and 3. The Apostle Peter says to these elders, pastors, overseers. those We just call them pastors. He says, shepherd the flock of God that is among you. That's an imperative verb. It's a command to you pastors. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Being examples to the flock. Pastors, it is your duty to set the example of what a faithful Christian in the midst of an abortion holocaust looks like. That's your duty. That's my duty. In 1 Timothy 4.12, Paul says to Timothy, Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example. Why are so many Christians apathetic? Because the pastors aren't setting the example of what it looks like to be faithful in this day. Set them an example in speech, now you speak. In conduct, how you live, 
in love, in faith, in purity. 1 Corinthians 4.16, Paul says, I urge you then, be imitators of me. He's saying, I'm going to model for you what it looks like to the best of my ability to be a faithful Christian. Pastors, do you wonder why people in your church are weak spiritually? Look in the mirror. You are the example of what a godly Christian looks like. Set the example. Open your mouth. Move your feet forward in faithfulness. And I'll tell you, if there are actually Christians that are a part of the congregation that you pastor, they will follow your lead. But if you have people who are just professors, they profess Christ, they honor him with their lips, but their hearts are far from him, and you start marching forward in this battle to abolish abortion and speak up for those who can't speak for themselves and rescue the weak and the needy, they'll fall off. They don't want any part of anything that's costly. But those who are regenerate, they're going to follow your lead. 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Philippians 3.17, brothers, join in imitating me, Paul says, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. 2 Thessalonians 3.7, for you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us. Because we were not idle when we were with you. Hebrews 13, 7. Remember your leaders, those who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Pastor, it's your job to lead the flock that Christ purchased with his own blood. Lead them by feeding them the word of God and by setting an example to the believers. Faithful pastors are not generals who send infantrymen into battle while giving orders safely from the rear through a radio. Amen. Faithful pastors are not that someone who just keeps a gate around Christ's sheep so that all the people don't leave. We've got to keep them all here. No, faithful pastors are like that general who leads the charge and bids all of the soldiers Follow me. Let's go. That's what a pastor is. Faithful pastors are shepherds who lead the flock into the green pastures of loving God and loving neighbor, no matter the cost. Many seem to be more concerned with entertaining goats than leading sheep. It seems that many pastors are more afraid of offending people than of offending Christ, their chief shepherd. Vodi Bauckham once said that, he wouldn't follow a typical American pastor out of a burning building. So that's how weak a typical Western church pastors are. I wouldn't follow that man out of a burning building. Men, may it not be so among us. Amen. You are the example to Christ's flock that he bought with his own blood. Set an example for the believers in your speech, in your conduct. May it not be so with us. May men want to not only follow us out of a burning building, but follow us to the gates of hell and to the state capitol to proclaim the lordship of Jesus Christ out of love for our neighbors. You will give an account, pastors. You, all of you, Christians, you will give an account. You'll stand before the Lord Jesus and give an account for what you have not and what you have done. What you have not said and what you have said. Will the Lord say, when it comes to you living in the midst of a holocaust, will the Lord say, well done, good and faithful servant. I'll leave you to think about that. And repent in whatever ways you need to. Pray with me. Our Father in heaven, we ask you to, to sear your word on our hearts. Help us to lead the way. Help men like me and the other pastors in this room or listening in any way. Help them to act like men. Help me to act like a man and set an example to the believers. Especially when it comes to rescuing those being taken away to death. 
forgive us for our apathy. Help us to stand firm in this day. Help us to open our mouth and speak up and point everyone to the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for sending your son to be the propitiation for our sins so that your wrath would be removed and we would have your love in him forever. We thank you for Christ. We ask you to equip us and help us to be faithful. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.